Hello everyone, this is Dr. Demi and I am here to record Chapter 3 Solutions of the Workbook. So if you have the workbook, please by all means attempt the exercises first, score yourself um, using this video and you can report back by commenting on the video how well you've done. Um, so I'm just going to be putting out the solutions to the workbook as quickly as I can because I want it to be all available to you before the major exams. Um, and then we'll see what other revision techniques we can use to ensure that you are preparing well for the exams um, without being too stressed or strained about your preparation. All right, let's get into it. This video will be really short um, because chapter three, in my opinion, is one of the easiest chapters in AS level. Um, so by all means, score yourself and I'm pretty sure you'll do great. So let's get into it. So this first question asks you to explain how enzymes work and it says you can use a diagram. Um, first things first is to always st state that enzymes have an active site and their substrates have shapes that fit into that active site. The enzymes and the substrates will collide and merge to form what we call an enzyme substrate complex. Please note that it is important for you to mention the enzyme substrate complex. I'm sorry about that. It is important for you to mention the enzyme substrate complex when you write your answer. I'm just trying to underline it, uh, but my pen always acts funny when I have biology. Um, when you write your answer and also to mention the active site of the enzyme as well as the substrates with the um, shapes that fit, because those are some of the three key points they might be looking at. Um, and they say you may use a diagram. So this means that it's optional. You don't have to, but I would advise that you do. And one of the easiest diagrams you can use is to just consider that this is your enzyme and your substrate would be something that fits into that. Okay, so you can just draw that to look whichever way you like. It's totally up to you. Um, what's, also, what's also important is to make sure you label it. Okay, so you label this as enzyme and you label that as substrate. Okay, so you, um, in answering this question, you start with your enzyme image. Um, I'm just going to erase this substrate for now. Um, and you use a plus, okay? And then you can draw the shape of your substrate. What's important is that your substrate has a shape that fits into your enzyme, which this one doesn't really exactly fit so it's always nice to use something you know you can't fill in okay so if you're going to draw like a square shape here then that would be perfect so that way you just need something with a square shape there and then you have to draw them being fitted together okay so this would then be your enzyme substrate complex And of course, that leads you to products. So you can maybe draw your products as um, the two parts of the substrates broken apart, um, but that's totally up to you. So this is one of the diagrams that you can use. You don't have to use it. Um, and usually they might not ask you to draw it, but just have in mind what the definition of how an enzyme works is and the key things that you have to note in your answer. This question says, what is the difference between the induced fit mechanism and the lock and key mechanism? So if you recall, or if you've watched the previous videos on chapter three, you will remember that enzymes can either walk through an induced fit mechanism or a lock and key mechanism. The lock and key mechanism is the very common one, which basically means that the substrate has a shape that fits the active site of the enzyme, pretty much like the key of your door fits into the lock. All right. The induced fit mechanism, on the other hand, is when the substrate doesn't really fit into the active site of the enzyme, but the enzyme is able to modify itself so that the substrate fits. So in other words, it induces the fit. It allows itself to change a bit so that the substrate can fit in perfectly and the reaction can take place. That is what the induced fit mechanism means. Then I put these in the workbook where I told you to use graphs to show the effects of these factors on enzyme activity. Um, and I'm just going to draw. So for temperature, oh wow, that's starting off really terribly. For temperature, you are, you have your axis, all right? And what you're going to have here on the y-axis would be the rate of the reaction. Okay, so rate of reaction, and over here you will have temperature. 
please, if you're asked to draw a graph like this, and make sure you put degrees Celsius. If you're asked to draw a graph like this, please make sure that you label the axis. Don't just draw the empty at lines and then leave it at that. So for temperature, as temperature increases, so does the rate of the reaction. All right. And then it eventually reaches an optimum. Um, after which it it um, it falls, um, the rate reduces. This optimum is somewhere around 37 degrees. Okay, and beyond 37 degrees, a lot of enzymes get denatured, and so they are unable to function. Um, this graph is a little bit too high. Please be a better artist than I am, um, because as you can see, my graph was more or less exceeding the axis, which it shouldn't. Um, so we'll just try to redo that like that okay that looks a little bit better it's not perfect but you get the gist of what i'm trying to do then um there's also the one to draw for substrate concentration so i'm just going to erase some parts here um actually i'll just redraw it so that it makes sense i'll try to redraw it this time to look better all right there we go so for temperature we're going this way and we have that okay so notice with temperature as the temperature starts to peak up even from zero the rate of reaction starts to increase and the optimum is usually around 37 some enzymes work at 30 degrees i think it totally depends um, but you can just label this and just say rather than putting the number here you can just say optimum temperature okay and obviously, remember to label your axis. So this is the rate of reaction, and this would be temperature. For substrate concentration, it's a bit different. Um, so when you have increase in substrate concentration, your rate of reaction will increase until all of your enzymes are saturated. So it tends to go something like that. Okay. Um, and again, this would be rate of reaction. And this would be substrate concentration. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Um, then we have pH. So what does pH look like? Um, enzymes have a narrow pH scale um, over which they function. So it doesn't start from zero. It's not like temperature that starts from zero and starts to pick up. It actually picks up somewhere in the center over there and they function with this, this, within this narrow range. So again, you would have pH and you would have rate of reaction here. All right, and the highest point again would be the optimum pH and it would depend on the enzyme you're working with, but just note that enzymes don't really work at highly acidic conditions because they will denature. And if it's too alkaline, that might also affect the enzyme activity. Then we have the competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. Um, when substrate concentration is increasing. So I'll explain what the inhibitors are because I think that's a later question. But um, when you have a competitive inhibitor, you basically have an inhibitor that has the same shape as your substrate. And so they compete with your substrate for the active site of the enzyme. So the reaction would be not as great as the substrate reaction graph where everything just sort of like went um, higher until some point, um, the reaction would be a lot slower. If you have a non-competitive inhibitor, non-competitive inhibitors do not bind to the active site, so they are not competing with your enzyme. What they're doing is they're binding at what we call an allosteric site. And when they bind at the allosteric site, they change the shape of the active site of the enzyme. So that means the rate of reaction is going to be much lower. So this is a non-competitive inhibitor and this is a competitive inhibitor. And as you can see with the non-competitive inhibitor, once the shape of the enzyme changes, um, you will find that the reaction just sort of stays flat because the substrate is unable to bind. I'll explain more about competitive and non-competitive inhibition, I think, on the next question. But just to answer this one, I asked you if you had to design an experiment to test um, or to figure out the rate of reaction of lipase, how would you do it? 
what I really wanted to know here was how would you, um, what exactly would you test um, if you were testing for rate of reaction? Always note that when you're checking the rate of reaction, what needs to change is the substrate concentration while the enzyme concentration remains constant. In this case, lipase is the enzyme, so you will need a fixed amount of lipase for every experiment that you run. So let's say, for example, here you have three test tubes and you have a fixed amount of enzyme in each test tube, right? Or for each test tube, rather. And you have varying concentrations of milk. So let's say this is test tube number one. And in test tube number one, we have 2% milk. In test tube number two, we have 5% milk. And in test tube number three, we have 10% milk. Okay? Um, so those are the varying concentrations. Our enzyme that we're going to add into this will have to be the same amount. So if we're adding one mil of enzyme in this um, test tube A, it will also be one mil in test tube B, and it will be one mil in test tube C. We also have an indicator, phenolphthalein is an indicator, and it's pink in color, but when lipase reacts with milk, phenolphthalein will turn colorless um, to tell us that the reaction has occurred. So you would also use a fixed amount of phenolphthalein, and that can maybe be uh, maybe one mil of phenolphthalein. Okay, so first things first is you put your milk in the jar, you put your phenolphthalein in, the solution turns pink, and then you add your enzyme, which is going to be one mil of H into that. What you will get is a graph that looks like this. So rate of reaction and substrate concentration. Okay, so we started, I mean, then you'd have a control, obviously. Um, that's always important. Your control would have water, all right? It would have phenolphthalein and it would have the lipase enzyme, all right? So you have phenolphthalein and you add lipase. So that would be your zero concentration, and you would see that nothing happens, right? Because um, when you time it, nothing changes. It just stays pink, so that's zero. Um, when you time everything at two, you might get a rate of reaction that's maybe this much. At 5% milk, you might get a reaction that's that much. At 10% milk, you might get a reaction that's that much. And if you draw it, it starts to follow the graph of substrate concentration versus rate of reaction. So just bear in mind that when you're testing rate of reaction, you're using the substrate concentration um, as your, your, your change in substrate concentration frequently, basically. Okay, so now we finally come to what competitive and non-competitive inhibitors are. Um, and in this question, I asked you to explain the mode of them, which I've already said. So a competitive inhibitor, so let's assume you had an enzyme that looks like this. Okay, your competitive inhibitor would be one that can fit into that space over there. So even though the substrate, which might look something like that, is also trying to fit in, it won't be able to because competitive inhibitor is occupying its space. But competitive inhibition can be addressed by increasing substrate concentration. So when you increase the amount of substrate in the solution, the competitive inhibitor um, will have less chance of binding with the enzyme. Because remember in the reaction, these molecules are moving around and colliding with each other. So if there are more substrates, then there is a higher chance the substrates will collide with the enzyme. Um, and so you can increase substrate concentration to overcome competitive inhibition. Non-competitive inhibition, on the other hand, is not as easily reversible. Um, so let's say again, this is our substrate now. And this is um, our enzyme rather. This is a weird enzyme, obviously. Um, so over here, this is our active site where the substrate would normally bind. This site over here is called an allosteric site. And I've sort of explained that here, yeah. An allosteric site. What a non-competitive inhibitor will do is it will not bind where the substrate is supposed to bind. It will come and bind at the non um, at the non-active site, which is the allosteric site. When it does that, what it will do is it will change by binding there. It will change the shape. Okay, so it will change the shape. Notice that the shape here is a lot straighter. Now the non-competitive inhibitor is sitting here. It will change the shape of the binding site. So when the substrate comes looking like that, it's too loose for it to fit into... Okay, I'm not doing a good job with the substrate, um, but I have these videos already, so you can just go and watch them. It will not be able to fit into the binding site because the shape of the binding site of the active site has changed. Um, and so for that reason, the reaction will not be able to occur, which is why the rate of reaction when you have a non-competitive inhibitor is really low. 
Um, then I ask you to define following terms and the implications on enzyme reactions. And the first one was Vmax. Um, and Vmax basically just shows, again, how the substrate concentration affects the rate of the reaction. It's the maximum rate of reaction at different substrate concentrations. And it tells you at what substrate concentration the enzyme performs optimally. Because beyond a certain substrate concentration, things flatten out. Um, and so when things flatten out, then you're not going to have any headway with your reaction. This is the last slide, I believe, and um, this is asking for a definition of Km. So Km is typically half of Vmax, and it tells you the proportion of active sites of the enzymes that have been occupied by the substrate. What Km is basically telling you is the level of affinity between the substrate and the enzyme. The higher your Km value, it means you need more substrate in order for the enzyme to bind to the substrate which tells you that the enzyme has a low affinity for the substrate. Again, I've explained these in previous videos, so you can just go watch them. The advantages of enzyme immobilization, they're easy to recover and reuse the enzyme. It protects the enzyme for, um, from changes in pH and temperature. And obviously, when you have industrial processes, um, reusing the enzyme can be cost effective. Then I ask you for the last question to label the graph to show Vmax and Km, and um, that's pretty easy. So Vmax is always the line. You just need to draw a line, and sometimes you get this in um, in the exam. Okay, I am. Um, I don't know why I struggle when I'm drawing on my computer um, as opposed to when I'm drawing on paper. It's, it's a weird thing. I'm just. I'm yet to understand. But Vmax is basically. You need to draw a straight line that is matching the top of the curve, all right? Not what I'm doing right now. So a straight line that goes to the top of the curve. Okay, that's not too bad. So that's your Vmax. And your Km would be half of that. So you figure out what's the half of this point here. Okay, and um, of this point here rather, sorry. What's the half of this point here? And then you take that and then that would be your KM. Okay. So yeah, that's it on the chapter three questions. As you can see, they're very easy, very straightforward. I hope you scored yourself and you did really well. I will see you on the next video where I explain chapter four. All the best. Goodbye.